Survivor, a show where we meet some people who've overcome some hardship in life. When I think of a survivor, I think of someone who's still knee deep in troubled waters, who just has their head right above and barely keeping afloat. And then when I think of a thriver, I think of someone who's been able to pull themselves out of the water and get in a boat and move to better destinations. So today our topic is homelessness. If you don't think that homelessness is a problem in Connecticut, the numbers say otherwise. Every year there's a point in time event that counts the number of homeless people in Connecticut. And last year the count was at 3,500 over 3,500 actually, and that was only counting people who were staying in emergency shelters. Every other year they count everybody, or they attempt to count everybody in Connecticut, including the homeless people that are not in shelters, and that count a couple years ago was more at over 4,500. So today I'm actually at the University of St. Joseph where they're having a Cardboard City event to raise awareness for homelessness. And University of St. Joseph is actually the school I attend. And I think this is gonna be a great event. They have several things on the agenda, including a panel of people who will share their experience of being homeless. Some of them were homeless, some of them are still homeless. And they'll also have activities to, uh, for people to play out what it's like to be in that situation. And we'll also tune in and ask some of the people at this event what their perspective is like. So let's see what we have in store. So there's this video called Rethink Homelessness, which you can check out on the internet machine when you get home. Um, this guy went around and he said, hey, what's something that someone wouldn't know about you if they just walked by you on the street? And these were some of their answers. Second one. Third one. And fourth one. So anyway, so what do you think of a person who is homeless? Like, there's a story there, and the stories are diverse. Those weren't stories I was conceptualizing when I was in high school or freshman in college. The number one cause of homelessness is a lack of affordable housing. And the reason why that makes sense is because if people can't afford a place to live, people are gonna end up homeless. It's kind of a cycle. You don't have a house, so you can't use an address. You have no address, so you can't get a job. You can't get a job because you have no house, so it just keeps going back to the cycle, and it's a never-ending cycle. Yeah, and the thing about living like that is that you spend so much time um, trying to fulfill your basic needs uh, you know, where are you gonna where are you gonna get clean clothes? Where are you gonna shower? Uh, where are you gonna eat? It's it's always um, a race to the next basic thing to keep you going. So uh, if someone says, "Well, why don't you just get a job?" You say, "Yeah, okay. Uh, maybe when I get some clothes that I can, and maybe you know, when I get some transportation, maybe when I get a few other things, uh, you know, I certainly will take a job." Yeah, well, there's a a situation where you have to be out by seven or eight and then by four in my job situation I, I would work from like 11 in the morning to nine at night so I had kind of like a, a serious issue there about getting back but I would have to get permission from my boss to leave a little early and t so I can get back at time and you know he got fed up with that that's how I lost the job at the, you know the first one I had I didn't want to explain to him the situation or where I had to be and so you know I, I was pride you know I, I, you know if it would have happened again I would I'm quite sure he would let me go underneath some circumstances. Uh, the choice was uh, you can either make it back to the shelter in time or you can take the job and chances are you're not going to make it back to the shelter in time and not know where you're going to sleep. You get a free meal, you got a, a, a nice warm bed and you know you don't have to sleep on the floor, you get showers. It was like a hundred men to three showers. Literally a hundred men to three showers. And the smell, I could just still, even when I'm talking about it, it was the most horrible smell ever I ever encountered in my life. And um, uh, don't get me wrong, I mean, some, some, it's a necessity 
you have to move, but I'm looking at it as a short-term situation, not a long-term. You got people that's chronically, chronically homeless over and over and over again. And so you become immune to the smell. I, I don't think I ever will become immune. Right now, as I speak, I'm, I'm homeless still. Um, I, I basically couch surf. And I, I stay at maybe three, three, maybe four different places uh, uh, every month. Um, the primary place I stay is um, elderly housing where I have to um, sneak in and out more or less because I'm not supposed to be there and there's limitations on letting your family uh, stay. The Salvation Army comes to mind as one that always rejects people who are who are LGB, especially rejects transgender people, will also reject anybody who is uh, who they think as not being a legal citizen of the United States, will also, you know, reject families who have teenage boys because they feel that they won't be safe with the men, but also will pose a threat to the women. The way down is a whole lot faster. When you start to lose things, you lose them fast. And um, then trying to get back up from there um, seems like it's a, it's a really, really uh, difficult task. A homeless person has no idea whatsoever what is day going to come. A person in prison has a, has a day. They can get up and take a shower, they can eat, they can get on the telephone, they can write a letter, they can go to school, uh, they can watch TV. Uh, they can stay in the bed all day. A homeless person has none of that. He has no idea what his day is going to be. He is like a, what they call a GPS. He's just following and trying to make it through the day until 4 o'clock so you can get back in. Rainy days, you know, the cardboard boxes, the made-up umbrellas, um, sleeping in hallways, going to the library and reading a book and falling asleep with shades on. All these things are very, very important to a homeless person because he or she has no idea, no idea what the day is going to be. And I think that is it's sad, but the reality is it shows you how high everybody else is to a, a, a homeless person. He has no idea. There's a phenomenon called throwing the brick. And throwing the brick is what some people do um, in the winter, instead of dealing with the shelter system or sleeping on the street, um, they will actually commit some small petty crime, maybe throw a rock through a window, uh, and get themselves thrown in, in the can so that they don't have to deal with the uh, harsh New England um, weather. Now that even surprised me. Uh, and I had been homeless for a while when, when this took place. That uh, I just didn't, I just didn't see that coming. You know? The group that is is pushed together um, is just so random. Uh, you know, there could be uh, mental illness. It could. It's all. Um, you know, I mean, at least I can say this: when you go to prison, um, they sort of keep everybody in areas where. Uh, you know, if there's a mental illness thing going on, that they end up in a special place. If there's a suicide, they, then they end up over here. Whereas you go into a shelter and it's just a random. I mean, and, and for families, that's got to be really, really horrific. Seeing kids, young kids, going to school, not being able to have their friend come to their house because they were living in the shelter. I thought that was the lowest of the points. Seeing little kids sleeping on floors, 17-year-olds, um, 14-year-olds. 15 years and, and that was just really devastating to me because here I am I was well into my 50s when you know I mean 40 late 40s and I thought it was okay for for an older guy to be and not for a young kid imagine you or you or you going to school and not be able to bring your friends home because you, you're going to a shelter a lot of our LGBTQ youth end up homeless and you know end up being denied from shelters and they don't get any of that protection you know they don't get the some of the services that you can get out of shelters because of it and you know this it, it's scary to think that you know the kids that you see dropping by the office don't go home anywhere we need to stop it it's it's sad it's awful like i want to be a special education teacher and it's troubling to think that some of my kids might end up on the streets or in prison. So uh, if you drove by me on the street, would you say, hey, 
There's a homeless guy. Maybe I should stop and help him out. Would that be the first thing that came to your mind if you saw me on the street? Probably not. Right? But uh, the reason I say that is because uh, an awful lot of us who are homeless, uh, we don't walk around with a sign that will tell you, I'm homeless. Uh, you could be sitting next to a homeless person in your math class, and you might never know it. Uh, there's an awful lot of invisible homeless in the world. And there's an awful lot of people very close to being homeless. <laughs> I grew up in South Windsor, um, the youngest of four, and had a fairly normal childhood, other than the fact that uh, my father passed away when we were very young, so my mother had to take care of the four of us. But fortunately, uh, he managed to pay off the house somehow, uh, even though he died when he was 38 years old. Uh, so we had a place to live. Uh, we weren't um, wealthy by any means, but we had everything we needed. And uh, I always worked hard. I was working tobacco when I was 14 years old. Uh, I was pretty headstrong. Um, had my own ideas about stuff. And so uh, I wanted to have my own business, and uh, I managed to do that. Uh, taught myself how to do auto body work. and started restoring antique cars, uh, worked my way up to the point where I had um, a frame machine and a tow truck and uh, a body shop full of equipment and uh, I decided to purchase a, a commercial building that my shop was in and I was able to get uh, one of my customers um, who was a fairly well-off attorney to uh, carry the mortgage on the, on the, bit, on the uh, building. And at that time, everything in real estate was going up, up, and any type of real estate you bought, you, you really couldn't lose. Um, that was until um, Colonial Realty, you guys are too young to remember that, but some of you might, uh, um, sort of collapsed, and it, the whole real estate bubble <coughs> collapsed with it. And uh, so I had a, uh, a, what they call a blue note due on my mortgage and uh, I wasn't able to get refinancing. So I was in the process of liquidating the business that I had built up over, um, uh, we'll say maybe 12 years of hard work. Um, actually a little longer than that. Um, and in the process of liquidating the business, um, I had got into a car accident. Uh, it wasn't my fault, uh, a truck hit me in my uh, little uh, Toyota Land Cruiser uh, and crushed it up like a beer can and hurt my back. Uh, so uh, at that point I was spending most of my time going to physical therapy and uh, between the doctor, the physical therapist and the lawyer uh, and just liquidating the business. Um, so I was expecting, you know, down the road to get some lawsuit money which is all good and fine, uh, except that uh, I got addicted to painkillers. So uh, my addiction uh, took over, and uh, by the time I actually got the money, uh, I was pretty much uh, in a bad place. And that's what led to me becoming homeless. Uh, when I reached that point, um, I ended up living in cars. Um, one winter in particular, it was extremely cold. Uh, I was in a uh, Mercury marquee with a flat tire and a broken window, and myself and my girlfriend were living in it. It was parked behind an abortion clinic on Market Street in Hartford. And amazingly, it didn't get towed, which uh, was pretty amazing. But uh, for the whole winter, um, we lived in it. and. Uh, if you went by the car, you wouldn't even know there was people in it because we would have to pile so many blankets uh, on us to stay warm. Um, I can honestly tell you that I think going to prison saved my life um, because at that time there was some pretty strong and stuff. And shortly after I got out, a lot of people um, did, uh, we did experience a lot of overdoses in Connecticut. Um, um, that easily could have been me. So um, going to jail was a blessing for me. Um, and, you know, I just decided to uh, take control of my life and, and rebuild it. Uh, 
uh, thanks to Hands on Hartford and Charter Road Cultural Center, uh, I was able to get a full scholarship to Goodwin College uh, in my second semester. Uh, I've been completely clean and sober the whole time. I do have a 14-year-old daughter. You know, I had to rebuild <coughs> that relationship. Now she can see that a person can hit bottom and, and, and pick themselves up and uh, because I'm out of school and all that stuff. Uh, so things are really good now. Um, I was raised in Hartford, uh, the eldest of, of four uh, siblings. Uh, uh, I went to college, I went to high school here, owned my own company, uh, nonprofit organization, and like Logan said, uh, work as a manager in a clothing store. And I think for me, um, I, I was looking at one of those and I fit like three of those categories. And I'm not ashamed about it, I think I learned from it. And one of them was uh, addiction. Uh, other one was domestic violence. And I believe the third one was underemployed. I think that was one of them at the time that I had lost my job through the drinking and the drug. And um, my first night was night of hell. I never forget the first night. Sleeping first, I slept on a park bench because I had a, a domestic uh, violence issue uh, with my wife then and I was asked to leave the home. Uh, fortunately, I still had a job at the time. Uh, the scary thing about it was that that first night on the bench, uh, I didn't really take it serious. I thought maybe I'd be home in a couple of weeks or something like that, or you know, maybe they'd just throw the case out because I had never had these issues before. The drug and alcohol was prevalent in my life, but I had managed it for a long time until this incident uh, transpired. And um, I can remember going, signing in, and and it's like this long line, all these people, the stench in there was unbelievable. I mean, and I had my little backpack and I'm just waiting to get called in. Never really got a bed, had to sleep on the floor. I think the, the biggest point of that night was clutching my bag, wondering what I'm gonna do tomorrow. It had sunk in that, that powerful. I mean, it was really serious to the point where I knew I was gonna go to work the next day, but I had no idea what I was gonna do for food, because they kick you out in the middle of the day. At least I had a place to go at that time. And um, on the way back home, I would have to get there. I would have to leave work early to get there or else I would lose my bed. So I had a two-pronged problem. Uh, you know, if I was late, my bed would be given away. I think the most powerful thing for me was that I seen a lot of people that I went to high school with. I seen a lot of people that I grew up with, and I felt like, wow, this is a, a reunion. You know, what's going on here? You know, and I finally f realized that getting up in the morning, not knowing where to go, you know, I, eventually I had lost my job due to the drug and the alcohol. I kept, you know, I just delved in a little bit more harder instead of sticking to the game plan that I had of going to work and hopefully getting back home at some point. And I would hide because of the shame and deprivation of people seeing me, you know, walking around with homeless people, uh, people on the bus, you know, I would take uh, routes, different ways to keep from being seen. And I think the scary part for that is that because it seems like to me the homeless person, he's the lowest person on the total phone, a murderer, a robber, all these people are higher in rank than that homeless person. What started me to really want to fight this thing is that the shame and deprivation of being homeless. Uh, recently, within like a month, I had a situation where I was asked to leave because of some winter damage in, in my house where I lived at. And come to find out I wasn't relocated because I was not on the lease. And I'm telling you, the fear struck back in me so deep that I fell into a many, many uh, depression because I didn't want to have to go back, even though I had a job and money saved, I didn't want to have to go back to that situation again or ever go into a shelter. I had rather just like, you know, call it the night and go to jail before, and that's, that's serious, before I would go back to uh, that homeless situation. And I had no idea how I was gonna face it, you know. Being 52 years old, I thought my life was on the right track. So I found out that, wow, if I'm not on the lease, then I'm still considered homeless. Even though I'm working and I got a nice place to stay, you know, food every night, and I thought about it long and hard, is this fear. Here go a guy who got a college education, a good job, faced all the dilemmas, overcame them, having, you know, the drugs and the drink, and I overcame those problems. And I just sat there in, in, in tears wondering, you know, I miss a, a lot of time due to this situation. And I had to go see some professional people about this. This was very serious to me. I mean, just the fear. 
So, you know, um, I tell you guys, this is, this is a serious problem. This is a real serious problem because one day you think you got it, and the next day you could be right back in the same situation again. Yeah. It sounds like you've been through some really tough stuff, um, and but sitting here, like you're, you have such so much joy. Like mm -hmm. that's just, I get so much of that from you. What's the source of that from you? For for you, like how do you, how have you kept that through everything? Well, uh, I'm a strong believer in God, and also mm -hmm. I'm a member of Cathedral St. Joe's, mm -hmm. so I'm an active member. That's what keeps me going. Mm -hmm. Well, God and foremost, He helped me with the with the faith I had in him, knowing that everything was gonna be okay. And then I used the resources that was out there available for me to help me get through the situation I was in. I am grateful for the services of um, the church groups who have soup kitchens. Uh, these things really, really make a difference. They really, really do. Anybody who volunteers in a soup kitchen, God bless you because it, it's needed. So I've worked with the homeless for a number of years and now I have the privilege of connecting our students um, with the homeless and other social service agencies, which is one of our core values, compassionate service. We've heard three different stories today and they all were around, they all worked, but they couldn't afford housing. So why is our wages too low or why aren't we able to help society with affordable housing. Mm -hmm. um, these are just basic nece necessities, necessaries, things that we need as society and we need to help. And I'm just, you know, hoping that I do my part in that. For me, it's, it's enlightening, uh, you know? Like, I come from Newington, which is the town over. It's a little bit poorer than West Hartford, but we're not exposed to homelessness as much. Um, fortunately enough, I come to this fantastic school. I've been fortunate to be in charge of a club that really does, we're trying to be activists for homelessness, for racism, and we just want to, you know, make a name for ourselves. And this is a wonderful way for students, for even community members to come in and just learn about something that affects thousands of people. I, I had to come, this is good therapy for me because I wanted them to know that I'm technically still homeless right now today. And I got a good job, a manager at a, a nonprofit organization. And I think about it every day, you know, what can I do? What, what can we do as the people to try to fight this thing, you know? The shelter is all it's doing is putting a roof over your head. That's it. It's not, you know, not really giving you services. And so uh, I think uh, if there's a way to uh, improve the system, the way they've been able to improve those other systems, uh, that's what I think of. You know, uh, things that will give people back their self-esteem, small steps in the beginning, and then find out where, where it is they belong, what, what is their need. I am here facilitating an event on ALICE. In November, United Ways from around Connecticut and six other states released the ALICE report. ALICE stands for Asset Limited Income Constrained Employed. It basically represents a population of people who are living above the federal poverty level who are still living paycheck to paycheck and struggling to make ends meet. Ellis households often do not qualify for state or federal programs and they have difficult, difficulty with making ends meet and saving. The Ellis report defines a survival budget for a family of four as around $65,000 a year, which is just barely able to survive. So this activity puts people into groups and they become a family and they have to struggle to make ends meet. In about 10 more, in about maybe five or 10 more minutes, I'm gonna have them open up the United Way Opportunity Envelope. And at that point, something in that envelope will allow them to hopefully be able to make ends meet and maybe even save a little bit. So we're gonna find out in maybe about just five minutes what the opportunities are gonna be that each of these families are gonna receive. At United Way, we are committed to making our community stronger by making families like Alice stronger. Through United Way supported programs like community schools, families are able to access resources while their children receive quality education, after school programming, and three meals a day. Programs like volunteer income tax assistance, which is VITA, V-I-T-A, 
um, gives families a financial boost when they have their taxes filed for free. And then we also have um, volunteer budget coaching. That's a free service that provides families an opportunity to build savings. And Workforce Solutions Collaborative helps individuals gain skills and training that will allow them to advocate or advance their careers and earn a living wage. What made me want to start was when I got off of a basketball game and the guy was sitting on the curb and he was hungry and I asked him, was he hungry? And I had a cheeseburger in my hand and he said yes and I gave it to him with the five dollars that I had. And ever since that I wanted to, you know, help people more and then as I got back into church I realized that was God's calling for my life. Well, I had my first event in Bridgeport. Um, um, it was more just to help homeless people who didn't have clothes get more clothes and, you know, a chance to eat some warm food and not be cold. Um, I had an event in West Hartford where I was giving out coats and now I have an event coming up April 18th at 750 Weathersfield where it's again giving out clothes and food and just giving back to the community. Because something makes you uncomfortable doesn't mean you shouldn't address it. If something scares you, it doesn't mean you shouldn't address it. If something makes you nervous, you know, you have to look inside yourself and say, well, you know, maybe it is difficult to talk to that person. Maybe it is difficult to deal mm -hmm. with that, that person who's, who's handicapped and doesn't speak very well, or that person who's uh, going through addiction issues. Uh, maybe those things aren't comfortable all the time. But uh, the bottom line is that um, everybody deserves compassion. Um, addicts do recover. And um, everybody can use uh, some common decency. It's especially damaging that we can so easily forget about people and think that you couldn't just as easily be forgotten about. In Louisiana, on March 29th, 2011, Cody Smith, 17, was charged with second-degree murder for shooting homeless man John L. Farrell, 49, to death in a dispute over a radio. Farrell was pronounced dead at the scene. Smith was already serving a seven-year prison sentence for possession with intent to disrupt when charged with murder. Indianapolis, Indiana, April 22nd, 2011. In a particularly harrowing incident, four gang man members, aged 19 to 26, were arrested in association with the death of a homeless man, Stephen McGuire. A surveillance video captured the attack during which four boys and a girl began kicking McGuire while he was sleeping. The perpetrators can be seen laughing as they kick and punch McGuire, who lies on the ground. Even after his death, the group returned with three others to admire their work and poke at the body. McGuire was a Marine Corps veteran who had close connections to his community and his family. Though he could have lived with his family, he suffered from bipolar disorder and did not want to burden anyone, so he chose to live on the streets. Homeless man John Abley, 64, was beaten to death by an unknown assailant in his 20s while sitting at a bus stop. The attacker was chased off and bystanders intervened and Abley was taken to the hospital where he died six days later. Abley's long white beard led me led many who saw him on a regular basis to finally call him Santa Claus. He was also the father of 10 children, some of whom had tried to get Abley off the streets, but because he became acclimated to his life, life he refused. Despite this, his children accepted him for who he was and spoke out on the issue of homelessness. Jeremy Abley, the victim's son, said if they're homeless, they still have the right to live just like any other human being. The name of the poem is Walk a Mile. Oh. Picking up cigarette butts off the ground. I asked an old man for a dollar. Walking all night, the shelters are full and the cops, they're looking to call. And it's been raining all day, so I got a hot meal in the local soup kitchen. Tried for a job, but I couldn't find work because I'm not in working condition. Walk a mile in my shoes, walk a mile. Went down to get my final check at my last place of employment. I would gamble away most of my pay, but at least it gave me enjoyment. I went to the park, stayed there till dark, where the old man kept repeating his story. He said, I fought in the war. Don't remember what for. Take a look at what's left of my glory. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile. Walk a mile in my shoes. 
Walk a mile, walk a mile. From commanding a fleet to a man on the street, my life took a turn for the worst. But what's most disturbing is the ghost in my bourbon <coughs> who haunts with insatiable thirst. I lived there on that bench just under the stench and laughed as he gave me his bottle. Said, here's to you, friend. Go well to your end, knowing you've met your role model. Walk a mile in my shoes, walk a mile. Walk a mile in my shoes, walk a mile, walk a mile. Walk a mile in my shoes, walk a while in my shoes. Walk a mile, walk a mile.